This is a song I learned at GA this year. Um, the author is Wendy Luella Perkins. It's, as she describes it, a soul song. It's very short so that you can memorize it easily. I encourage you to sing and hum along and harmonize. What am I rushing to? 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 Slow down, slow down, and savor. Slow down, slow down, and savor. What am I rushing to? 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 Slow down, slow down, and savor. Slow down, slow down, and savor. What am I rushing to? 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 Slow down, slow down, and savor. Slow down, slow down, and savor. What am I rushing to? 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 Slow down, slow down, and savor. Slow down, slow down, and savor. Thank you. Our first snow came, our first significant snow came this weekend. And what is that but an invitation to slow down and savor? Sometimes literally in the case of driving, but also it is a time of invitation to move slower, to store up what we need for the winter to rest. And so this morning, I invite you to set down whatever it is that you are carrying with you, metaphorically or literally. Maybe that's, and have your mind only here. So what would it take to set aside the plans for the afternoon or the to-do list for the week? or whatever it else, the worries, the cares that are swirling. Maybe you need to take a moment and literally write them down so they can get out of your head. I invite you to do that and just be here only and not scattered in many directions. I invite you to take a few slow breaths and I invite you to adjust your body as you need to be 10% more comfortable for this time ahead. So come, let us gather across the magic of Zoom 
and in person. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. I'm Ann Feldmeyer, and I'm here as a member of the Sunday Services Committee. I'd like to welcome you all to this service and a special welcome to anyone visiting today. We hope that someday soon, we'll all be able to meet here together again in person and get to know one another. I have a special announcement to make today, and that is that we have formed a committee to resettle two Afghan refugee families. Uh, five years ago in June, we, re we began resettling a Syrian family with wonderful success. They are very, very um, settled now and, and thriving. So as we all know, we've seen from the news, there are many Afghan families arriving all over the country. And this time we've put together a team comprised of three congregations, our People's Church congregation, two of the synagogues in town, uh, the Congregation of Moses and Temple B'nai Israel. And about a third of the nearly 30 people that have volunteered to serve on this committee are from each congregation. So it's an, an interfaith resettlement team. If you have any um, interest in being part of that team, please contact me. My um, email is annfeldmeyer18 at gmail.com. And there will be information, there is information in the newsletter and there will be in the next newsletter. The um, things we need right now from, from people's people and the community in general is really pretty much financial donations. There are lots and lots and lots of donations of household wares and furniture, but we need the financial donations to purchase things like um, televisions. Everybody is going to need a television. This is for the, fam the two families we're sponsoring. We also help with um, groceries initially before they get signed up for uh, food stamps now called bridge cards and other needs that are much more expensive. Last time when we uh, re resettled the Syrian family, we raised about $10,000 in our church and with community also members donating. And we spent nearly all of that very wisely. So if you are so moved, please, it will be in the newsletter, but please make a donation and note that it is for the refugee resettlement of the family that we are sponsoring. It'll be sorted out by um, Diana when, when we do this, but please note that. And if you would like to be helpful again, please contact me. And I have an announcement as well. Um, this Friday at 11 a.m. at Stetson Chapel at Kalamazoo College, there is a Transgender Day of Remembrance service. So vaccinated members of the Kalamazoo community are invited to attend this solemn service in which we will remember the transgender people whose lives were lost in acts of anti-transgender violence this year. The service is a collaboration between Kalamazoo College and Outfront uh, with participation from local religious leaders from traditions who affirm and celebrate transgender identities. So I will be among those participating and I wanted to make sure you all knew you were invited. So if you're vaccinated. So 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. Friday, Stetson Chapel at Kalamazoo College. And now I invite you into whatever posture helps you sing if you're at home or if you are here, I invite you to hum or whisper along to our next song.
For This One Hour by Paul Stefan Dodenhoff. For this one hour, spirit of life, we let go. For this one hour, may we let our go of our anxieties, our fears, our anger, our self-doubts, our regrets, our petty grievances, and our distractions. If only for this one hour, let the flame of this chalice burn them from our hearts and minds and light our way to peace and serenity for this one hour. If you are lighting a chalice at home, you are encouraged to type in the chat box, a chalice is lit in your neighborhood, your street, or your city. Thank you. The story I have to offer you today is a true story that happened about 200 years ago. On that day, a four or five year old named Theodore was out walking in the tall grasses near his home. He found a stream bubbling down the hill and followed it and noticed that on some rocks in the sun, there were turtles stretched out sunning themselves. Theodore, like, like many who are four or five or six walking through the woods or the meadows, had a stick in his hand because that, I think that is the rules, at least for some children, that they have to be carrying a stick and swinging it around. And he looked at those turtles and he thought about some older boys he knew who whenever they would see a turtle sunning itself on the rock would just whack it into the rip, into the water. And he kind of wanted to be like those big kids. So he got his stick and reared back and was ready to smack that turtle. And then he heard a voice and he didn't know at that time if that was a voice from outside of him or inside his own heart saying, why are you doing that? And he thought about it and he couldn't think of a good reason beyond trying to be like those older children to send that turtle who wasn't doing anything wrong off into the water. And so he gently took his stick down and shortly after and did not hit the turtle and shortly after that went home where he talked to his mother and said, this strange thing has happened. I was about to hit a turtle and then I heard something, someone say, don't do that. And his mother said, I think that's your conscience. 
I think that's the voice that's within you that tells you when you're about to do something wrong. And it's important to listen to that voice with turtles and with other things. And so that little boy grew up to be a man named Theodore Parker. And Theodore Parker is one of our, our religious ancestors that, that we should know about. He was a radical and an abolitionist in the years before the Civil War. He helped many enslaved people escape to freedom in Canada. He was the minister of the 27th Congregational Society in Boston. And just imagine a time when there was tw at least 26 other Unitarian congregations in that city. And he was so radical that the other, the other ministers would not exchange pulpits with him. And so he did a lot of this work on his own, trying to make the world a little more fair and a little more just. And in his autobiography, he traced it all back to that moment with the turtle and the stick and the voice that told him not to hurt that smaller creature. So that is our story for today. People's people are generous people. And one of the ways that we are generous is that once a month, we send our collection beyond the walls of our church to do good and important work in our community. Today, today is one of those days. And today our special offering recipient is the Unitarian Universalist Trauma Response Ministry. So this is a group within our religious tradition that is independent of the UUA that provides culturally sensitive spiritual care to survivors of mass disasters and other significant trauma. So they respond to help congregations that have experienced natural disasters, violence in their community, crimes within the congregation. And in August, they supported us when we had a church member who was arrested and a church member who died by suicide. So they were a tremendous help to us in many ways, including they, they operated some small groups for people who were especially impacted by the death by suicide, giving us space to talk and process and be told the things that we needed to hear to, to move forward in our grief. They gave us advice about how to communicate with the congregation. And they did things for me, like rem reminding me that I really should eat and sleep and all of the things that are hard to remember when you are heartbroken and grieving. And they did all of this, hours and hours of support from people who are experts in helping communities after suicide or helping with arrests. They did that all for free with the hope that at some point we might pay that forward and support the next congregation who is in a time of struggle. So that is what I'm inviting you all to today. So if you have the means, I invite you to give to the congregation in the ways you know how, and this week that money will go out to support the next congregation facing some sort of trauma or disaster and give them the professional external support they need to navigate it with as much care and grace as, as is possible in hard circumstances. So the offering will now be received.
From the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. People's people, Support one another in good times and in hard times. One of the ways that we do that is by taking time during our service to share the joys and sorrows and milestones in our lives. So if you have something you wish to share with our community, I invite you now, if you are joining us on Zoom, to type it into our Zoom chat box. If you are with us in person, I invite you to write it on a card and place it in the basket in the front of the space. And as I those come in, I will read them aloud and Anne will place a stone in our bowl of water as a symbol of how we are all holding one another in all of these in these days and also how but every everything that happens to each of us 
impacts all of us. And as we enter or move towards a time of silence, I have a poem to offer to guide this time for you. It's a perceptive prayer by Grace Bauer. She writes, summer nights is how they go on, light lingering so long we can imagine ourselves immortal for moments at a time. And winter days, their own kind of beauty any swatch of color, hint of leaf bud, bud, sway of dried brown grass, even litter, a bright yellow bag light enough for the breeze to lift and carry, can render itself as pleasure to an eye immersed in gray. May we learn to love what is both ordinary and extra. May our attention be a kind of praise, a worship of the all there really is. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with loving kindness. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Our first reading today is by the poet Ross Gay, and it's the foreword to an anthology of poetry called How to Love the World. He writes, I have been wondering about how we make the world in our witnessing of it. Or maybe I have come to understand, to believe, how we witness makes our world. That is why attending to what we love, what we are astonished by, what flummoxes us with beauty is such crucial work, such rigorous work. Likewise, studying how we care and are cared for, how we tend and are tended to, how we give and are given is such necessary work. It makes the world. Witnessing how we are loved and how we love makes the world. Witness and study, I, I should say. Witness as study, I think I mean. Truth is, we are mostly too acquainted with the opposite, with the wreckage. It commands our attention and for good reason. We have to survive it. But even if we understand the wreckage to survive it, it needn't be the primary object of our study. The survival need be. The reaching and the holding need be. The here, have this need be. The come in, you can stay here need be. The let's share it all need be. The love need be. The care need be. That which we are made by, held by, need be. Who's taken us in, need be. Who's saved the seed, need be. Who's planted the milkweed, need be. Who's saved the water, need be. Who saved the forest, need be. The forest, need be. The water the breathable air, that which witnessed us forth need be, how we love need be, how we need need be too, our radiant need, our luminous and mycelial need, our need to, our need immense and immeasurable, our need absolute need be, and that study, that practice, that witness is called gratitude. Our gratitude need be. This is what I want to study. This is with whom. Our second reading is by Rosemary Watola Tomer, and it's called How It Might Continue. Wherever we go, the chance of joy, whole orchards of amazement, one more reason to always travel with our pockets full of exclamation marks. So we might scatter them for others like apple seeds. Some will dry out, some will blow away, but some will take root and grow exuberant groves filled with long, thin fruits that resemble one hand clapping, so much enthusiasm as they flutter back and forth. And although nothing's heard, and though nothing's really changed, people everywhere for years to come will swear that the world is ripe with applause, will fill their own pockets with new seeds to scatter. And our second reading is Two Weeks After a Silent Retreat by Heather Lanier. How quickly I lose my love of all things. I nearly flick an ant off a cliff of an armchair. But remember, self, the week you spent in, in, enveloped in psalms, intoned by monks, 
By Wednesday, you beheld a three bald body creeping around the onion skin of your book. It's six teensy toothpick legs bent into all manner of delicate angles. Your chest became a doorway to a spacious, unmarked heaven. You love the ant. The kingdom, said Christ, is at hand, meaning not ticking above in a time bomb of gold paved streets, but tapping its antenna. Along the heart line of your imperfect palm. now my senses and hear the earth call feel the deep power of being in all keep with the web of creation your vow giving receiving as love shows us how wake now my reason Reach out to the new, join with each pilgrim who quests for the true, honor the beauty and wisdom of time, suffer thy limit and praise the sublime, wake now compassion, give heed to the cry. Voices of suffering fill the white sky. Take as your neighbor, both stranger and friend, praying and striving their hardship to end. Wake now, my conscience, with justice thy guide. Join with all people. Rights are denied. Take not for granted a privileged place. God's love embraces the whole human race. Wake now, my vision of ministry clear. Brighten my pathway with radiance here. toward a planet transformed by our care. Last May, I went for a walk with my mother and my two children. Since August of 2020, my family has been trying to walk every block of every street in the city of Kalamazoo. Uh, we did not realize how many blocks there are as we started, so this will take years, I'm sure. But we are persistent. And so that morning we started at West Nedge and Pioneer, right by Taco Bob's there. And we walked for about a half an hour up and down the nearby blocks, trying to keep a mental image of exactly where we walked so we could mark it on the map we have hanging in our dining room. And we finished our walk at the Axtell Creek play lot. And there, after my children exhausted themselves on the ropes and the merry-go-round there, we walked over, followed the path to the pedestrian bridge that crosses Axtell Creek there. Maybe you've been there. It's this really beautiful, almost tranquil spot right by the intersection of West Nedge and Crosstown. We sat on the bridge and watched the creek flow beneath us. And my five-year-old then pointed down the creek and said, is that a beaver? 
we all squinted to see. And it was some kind of brown, furry, swimming creature. Uh, but it didn't have the tail of the beaver. So I turned to my favorite naturalist, Google, and quickly discovered that it was a muskrat. It was, it was swimming in the creek, carrying some plants in their furry little mouth. And we watched as they swam up and down, gathering plants from one part of the creek and putting them somewhere that we could not place, that we could not see beyond a bend. And as we watched, quiet for small children, but very loud by any other measure, uh, a flock of ducks alighted and started quacking and squabbling and splashing amongst themselves. And my eldest child started to tell stories about them. Those two are brothers and they're fighting about the best food. And that mama duck is trying to keep her baby safe. And uh oh, here comes a bully swimming down the creek. And my youngest, who is three and a half, was enraptured just by all of the commotion and the muskrat and the ducks. So we watched for a while, which with children that age honestly could have been three minutes. But that is a rare amount of attention from them when screens are not involved. And there was joy and there was wonder. And as we left, I told my kids that it was the first time I think I have ever seen a muskrat. My mother said the same thing. And they were so proud that they got to see them when they were five and three, while these old people had to wait their whole life to see a muskrat. They were amazed that it could have taken us so long. And I was too, to be honest. So we spilled those our pockets full of metaphorical question or exclamation marks on that bridge, hoping that others might find their way. There were moments like that throughout my sabbatical time, which happened from February to July of this year. I noticed more of the animals who share our piece of earth than I ever had before. Beetles that glisten like jewels when the light hits them right. Hummingbirds, a turkey that ran through our front yard a few times. The turtles that live on the lake in a lake on the Western Michigan campus and the ducks and the muskrat. They have been here all along, surely. It was just that I did not yet have eyes to see. My senses were unawake. I did not have or did not make the time to be fully present to what was right in front of me. I had plans for my sabbatical. I wrote a plan for it that the board approved in late 2019, which might as well be decades ago at this point. There was going to be classes and research and deep rest, and none of that unfolded like I planned, just like most of us had plans upended again and again over the past pandemic seasons. So instead, I cared for my children allowing my spouse to go back to work full time for the first time since the pandemic started. I spent most of my days home alone with my three year old and my then five year old. There was remote learning kindergarten, but also a lot of empty time. Time for walks and baking and playing and reading and playgrounds. So many playgrounds. And I was also able to cover, carve out some time, though not a lot, for reading and writing things that were neither sermons or emails, which I forgot that I had the ability to do. So thank you for the gift of that time. I was recently with a group of ministers and the level of burnout among them was intense. There's been a wave of resignations by religious professionals over the last six months and by so many professionals across so many fields because it has been an impossible season for so many people. And that sabbatical made a tremendous difference for me. I don't know what kind of shape I would be in, honestly, without it. So thank you again. And so I realized well into the sabbatical, the spiritual work of that time for me 
was cultivating my attention, being intentional and careful with it, being fully present as much as I could. And this is really hard for me. Most of the time I have what the Buddhists call a monkey mind, where it's jumping from thing to thing, maybe present in 17 different places at a time. While I'm here, I'm also fig trying to figure out, okay, what am I doing with my children this afternoon? Have I thought anything about the sermon for next week? You know, who are the people I need to call this week? What are the emails in my inbox that I haven't been responded to? Which friends haven't I heard from for in a while that I should reach out to? And on and on and on and on. Perhaps that is how your brain works too. I know I'm not alone. And sometimes I'm really grateful for that. It, balls don't get dropped when you are thinking about everything simultaneously. And often my best ideas emerge when I'm cooking or putting away the laundry. And this habit does not always serve me. So when I get lost and don't listen to what my children say, or when I'm too focused on what's coming next to be right here, right now, when I try to do five things simultaneously and do none of them very well, Maybe you have that sort of monkey mind sometimes too. So in my sabbatical, I was able to tame that monkey, at least some of the time, at least more of the time, to do one thing at a time. To be present with my family in a new way because the work to do list was not constantly churning in the back of my mind. Although for the first two months of this, of the sabbatical, I had a panic every Saturday night thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't do anything for worship tomorrow. And then would remind myself, all oh, right, that's covered. So I didn't begin my sabbatical with this intention to work on my intention. It was more that I adopted it as a survival strategy. I noticed that the days that I was more present faced each moment as it came with patience and flexibility, sought the little bits of joy that would pop up if I was present to them. Everyone had a better time. On the days when I wasn't as present because I was in the middle of a good book and just wanted to read that that day, or I was thinking about something else, or I was just wanted the kids to sleep so I could do my projects. Everyone suffered. The kids could sense my distance and pushed harder for closeness, which of course was annoying, and then it just escalated from there. And it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out, okay, if I just face each moment as that moment and string those together with as much presence and joy as I can find, we're all going to be so much happier by the end of the day. So I stumbled into this work and I did okay. I definitely wasn't 100% present 100% of the time because there are only so many times that I could push a child on a swing before I reached into my pocket and started reading a book on my phone. I cultivated so much new respect for folks who do the work of caring for children day after day after day. There is so much monotony in that work. But presence does lead to joy. To silly, impromptu dance parties, to jokes and cuddles. To that time that we filled up the kiddie pool in the living room with crumpled up magazine pages and the kids sat in it pretending to be baby birds and I fed them leftover linguine noodles. And we did that again two weeks ago because it's my new favorite thing to do on a rainy day because it takes like at least an hour to crumple up that paper when your hands are so small. It's a perfect time killer and fun. What we pay attention to, our witness shapes the world, at least our corner of it, the poet tells us. Paying attention and studying these small beings and studying the care of them made all the difference. In the last week of my sabbatical, 
I read for the first time the passage that I read to you all a few minutes ago from How to Love the World. I'm going to read it again because it is so rich, it is worth hearing more than once. It's by the poet Ross Gay, who I think I endorsed from this pulpit last month, but it's still good. Reading this passage helped me find the words for the thing I was trying to do. I am a mystic, and so I often stumble experience first and then have to figure out how do you find the words that get to the thing that you are, are doing. He writes, I have been wondering about how we make the world in our witnessing of it. Or maybe I have come to understand, to believe how we witness makes our world. This is why attending to what we love, what we are astonished by, what flummoxes us with beauty is such crucial work, such rigorous work. Likewise, studying how we care and are cared for, how we tend and are tended to, how we give and are given is such necessary work. It makes the world. Witnessing how we are loved and how we love makes the world. Witness and study, I should say. Witness as study, I think I mean. Truth is, we are mostly too acquainted with the opposite, with the wreckage. It commands our attention and for good reason. We have to survive it. But even if we understand the wreckage to survive it, it needn't be the primary object of our study. The survival need be. The reaching and the holding need be. The here have this need be. The come in, you can stay here, need be. The let's share it all, need be. The love, need be. The care, need be. That which we are made by, held by, need be. Who's taken us in, need be. Who's saved the seed, need be. Who's planted the milkweed, need be. Who's saved the water, need be. Who's saved the forest, need be. The forest, need be. The water, the breathable air, that which witnessed us forth, need be. How we love, need be. How we need, need be too. Our radiant need, our luminous and mycelial need. Our need immense and immeasurable our need absolute need be and that study that practice that witness is called gratitude our gratitude need be that is what i want to study this is with whom what do we give our attention what do we witness what do we study these are vital questions for me and I invite you to consider them as well. How do we walk through the world with our metaphorical pockets overflowing with exclamation marks, ready to punctuate what must be witnessed by others, what is worthy of our attention and our care? This is the work that poetry so often calls us to, that paying attention to what is small and specific and important, the small moments worthy of our witness, praise, and care, the ant on a page, the yellow bag swirling in a wind. But it is not only the poets who demand that we give most of our attention to what matters most. The philosophers name this as well. French philosopher Simone Weil writes that attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. Our time is finite. How do we spend it? Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset believed that falling in love ultimately is a phenomena of attention. 
focusing so much on one other human that your whole world is altered. He writes, tell me where your attention lies and I will tell you who you are. Tell me where your attention lies and I will tell you who you are. What do you pay attention to? And what does that say about who you are? It is a cliche among clergy to preach a sermon immediately after a sabbatical that is the church version of the how I spent my summer vacation essay that so many of us were forced to write at various times. For me, it felt necessary to wait. Some of that was what was unfolding in our church, but I also felt like I couldn't say any of this with integrity if I hadn't come back yet into my normal life with my normal habits and the normal demands because anybody can have a life that gets really slow and get more spiritually deep. That's, that's not hard. That's not the work we can. I mean, if you go to the silent retreat, you will be silent enough to have things start happening in your soul. That is how that works. But the challenge is to live it, is to come back after the silent retreat and not try to flick all of the ants off the couch or to be present when there is so much demanding your attention. It is hard and it is a work in progress. I can't say that I have been totally transformed in any sort of way but at least I am aware of when I am not living up to who I want to be. There's a, forget what it is, but there's a, a framework that talks about how you move from unconscious incompetence to conscious, to, con to conscious incompetence, to conscious competence, to unconscious competence as you learn something new, which I think is so rich. And so I have at least developed the skill of awareness and sometimes can even be present without going to the full, <laughs> without the full extent of it. I can on purpose put my phone across the room and not have it in my pocket without having to think, I am going to make this profound spiritual choice in this moment. And that counts for something, but it is hard. It is hard. There are still more moments than I would like when I am that narrator of the poem, when I revert to old habits. But I have moments when I pay, pay attention well, when I witness what most needs to be witnessed. And I've learned that when it is time, when I notice myself out of balance or out of who I want to be, I can find the teachers that help me get back. So last, a few months ago, I was having a, a, challenging, a challenging week for a variety of reasons. And I thought, what I need to do is walk in the woods. So I went to Kleinstuck Preserve, that piece of land donated by a people's person to the State Department of Education 100 years ago and walked. And at one point, there a group of deer walked across the trail as often happens there. And it looked like a mother and her babies, although who knows, for real. And that one that seemed like the mother paused and looked at me. And we locked eyes for a few minutes or maybe a few seconds. And I felt seen. And I noticed this other being trying to do the work of care in the world and just felt a kinship, felt less alone in the work. And that counts for a lot. Who knows what that deer experienced? I have know nothing about deer consciousness, but it made a difference for me. It was one of those moments where I could exhale, lay down some of the burdens, 
and continue forward, knowing I was a little less alone in the work. On Thursday evening, we had our Isaac virtual banquet. And our speaker, our speaker was Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, who was phenomenal. And because I have Reverend in front of my name, I got to be in the inner circle and ask a question. And I asked him about how he comes back to this world again and again with hope when everything is heartbreak, heartbreaking again and again. So how do you pay attention to the love and the care in, a, in midst of all this wreckage? And for him, he said, it was Aretha Franklin and Luther Vandross and remembering that he is not alone. And that video will be online soon. So those of you who didn't see it can watch because it is, he says it way better than I ever could. But that is the work of finding joy and finding your people and doing the work that is yours to do and being careful about what you pay attention to. I have told you many times that that is important that maybe watch less news and do something that is more soul feeding than that. Because that is the work that is ahead of us. And we need to have to be re energized. We need to be re inspired and reconnected to each other and to that old, that truth that is when inside of us, the thing that spoke to Theodore Parker as a child with a stick. So Thank you all for the gift of that time. I am a better person and a better parent and a better pastor for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And amen.
As we return to the world from this time of attention, how might you go out with your pockets brimming with exclamation marks to scatter at the places of joy and amazement? I invite you to pay attention to what is worthy of your care, your study, your witness. May we all go in peace and go in love.